Good morning, Liberty Hill. How are y'all doing today? <laughs> doing good. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open with me to the book of James chapter 1. And you can just go ahead and hold your place. That's where we're going to be reading out of today. But as you heard from Miss Lacey, we are in a new sermon series called No Offense. And I don't know about you guys, but have you noticed how incredibly easily people are offended today? Some might even say, hashtag triggered. <laughs> Everywhere we look, it just seems like we see cancel culture, we see boycotts, we see protests, riots, social media outrage, virtue signaling, media gaslighting, propaganda, uh, big tech censorship, and, and the list just goes on and on and on. And the sad truth is the reason that we see so much of this and it's so prevalent today in our culture and our society is outrage sells. Now, the old saying is sex sells, and that probably still sells just as fine. But today we know that outrage sells because we see that most journalism today, uh, it's all been sensationalized. We know that polarizing headlines, they, they get more clicks. And so news outlets keep writing them and, and, and outrage, it, it gets people uh, energized. It gets people um, uh, just kind of woken up to what's going on and it gets people engaging. And when that happens, it funds advertising revenue. And so the question that I have for you this morning is, what is it about being outraged that keeps us so engaged? Why does it seem that we like it? Why is it that it seems like we are drawn to offense like bugs to that bright blue light? Right? You, just, you just can't avoid it. It just catches your attention. It gets you in trance and you just find yourself gravitating towards it and moving towards it and, and going towards a fence. When you're, when you're scrolling and you see that, that sensationalized headline, that polarizing headline, you're like, well, I got to know more about this. I've got to be aware of, of what's going on. And we may not easily admit this, but I think many of us like being angry. We may not actually enjoy close-up conflict, but I find that oftentimes we, we like to take a stance. We like to choose a side. And our natural instinct is one towards tribalism. And we find that we're more comfortable being pro-something or anti-something. We're more comfortable being for or against something. And we're more comfortable when we're surrounded by people who agree with us. And that dynamic, it, it breeds division because you're kind of drawing a line in the sand. You've got people on one side and people on the other side. And, and we see this and there's a, a limitless number of examples. We see vax and unvaxed. We see pro-Second Amendment, anti-Second Amendment, pro-choice, pro-life, Democrat, Republican, conservative, woke liberal, pro-Israel, anti-Semitic. We see that it brings division and what happens is this dynamic that we have that we're drawn to, what it does is it creates an us and them. And them is the enemy. And this dynamic, unfortunately, it's not absent from our churches. God calls us to, be, uh, to share in unity. He calls for us to be one. And as Christians... We think we get away with it because we, labor, we, we label our anger as righteous anger. Well, you don't understand. My anger is righteous anger when it lines up with my interpretation of truth and righteousness and uh, justice. And while righteous anger is a biblical concept, I think it's worth asking ourselves this this morning. Is the anger of mine actually righteous or is it just an excuse for me to prove that I'm right? Because I don't know about you guys, I like to be right. And most of the time I live my life with the assumption that I am right. And I would imagine that many people also do that. But sometimes I think that um, as Christians, we get the idea that we are God's enforcers when we're only called to be his followers. 
You see, God could have sent us a judge, but he sent us a savior. And God didn't call us to be his enforcers. He called us to be his followers. And God doesn't need enforcers seeing as how vengeance is whose? Come on, church, wake up this morning. Seeing as how vengeance is, y'all are like, it's mine. I, you know, <laughs> vengeance is the Lord's according to Deuteronomy 32, 35. And instead, God commands us to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. He calls us to be salt and light. We see that in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 13 through 16. And uh, I don't know about you guys. Y'all are totally distracted right now. I know. <laughs> As I was preparing this message and uh, reflecting on this series, I was kind of thinking about myself. And I was like, you know... As a mature and seasoned Christian like I am now, I just don't really walk in the flesh anymore. You know, I just, uh, I've always got the armor of God on. I've, I've always got the mind of Christ. You could say I, I have a pretty thick skin and, and I'm basically unoffendable at this point in my life. Well, you know, unless you hurt Zoe or Elle or my mom or you come against my church or you cheer for another team other than UGA, or you cut me off in traffic, you don't let me over in traffic, you tailgate me in traffic, or you drive too slow in front of me in traffic. Hopefully, you're picking up on my sarcasm. It turns out that maybe even I also am easily offended after all. And as I uh, discovered and I searched the scriptures and I prepared for this series and wrote this sermon, I feel like God started to really search my heart and I found that God really began to do a healing work and to show me where I too um, was so easily offended. And so over the next few weeks, I'm really just going to lay my cards out there for you guys. And um, I'll probably offend some of you. I'll probably offend all of you. <laughs> um, but I'll offend you with the goal of helping you get over your offenses, get over your anger, and maybe even your unforgiveness. And that's why my title for this morning's message is simply, Stop Being Offended. <laughs> so for all of you note takers, that's three words for you. Stop being offended. Would you guys pray with me real quick as we continue? Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your house. God, I'm thankful to have my beautiful family here together intact uh, for the very first Sunday at Liberty Hill. Lord, I'm thankful for the opportunity to share your word, share your truth. Would you please open the eyes and ears and hearts of every person in this room and every person joining us on live stream to be receptive to your word and your work in their lives today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. So today will be kind of like an introduction to this new series, No Offense. And in the upcoming weeks, we will really begin to unpack it in detail. So let's go ahead and start reading from the book of James, uh, chapter 1, verse 19, and we'll read more later. So this is James, the half-brother of Jesus, and he really lays it out for us like this. He says in verse uh, 19 of chapter 1, "'Know this, my beloved brothers.'" Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So here's what I want you to do. <laughs> I want you to ask yourself and be honest with yourself, how are you doing with this assignment? Are you quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger? Because... I think we live in a culture where not very many people are listening and they're very, very fast to speak and their opinions, uh, to speak their opinions and people are incredibly easily offended and often quickly angry. As Christians, as Christ followers, we're called to be slow to speak, quick to listen and slow to become angry. And in fact, when you Look at Jesus and the way he lived. This is exactly how he lived. You may have never looked at this, but I tend to be kind of a nerd sometime. Me and uh, Brother Bill, we like to be sort of nerds and nerd out over some things. But 
Do you know how many questions that Jesus um, was asked in the Gospels, as recorded in the Gospels? How many questions Jesus was asked by other people as is recorded in the Gospels? I'll answer it for you. 183. In the Gospels, Jesus is asked 183 questions. And this is the awesome thing about Jesus. And I guess you get to do this when you're Jesus. While he was um, asked 183 questions, do you know how many he responded to directly? That he actually just gave a straightforward answer to? Of 183 questions, he directly responded to three. Three questions. That's what you get. 183. And while he was asked 183 questions, do you know how many questions he asked? as is recorded in the Gospels? 307. The reason is Jesus was incredibly focused on others. Most of us today, we don't even hear what other people are saying because we're too busy thinking about what we're about to say. And Jesus didn't live that way, and he's our example. Jesus was slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to be angry. And as we think about this, Our assignment today is simple, that we would be people who are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And as we think about that subject, slow to become angry, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like, (laughs) I feel like anger has kind of evolved. And when I say evolved, I feel like it's more or less snowballed in a way because it used to be the little things that set us off, right? It used to be just kind of simple, dumb, trivial things that used to set us off. You know, like when you go through the drive-thru and you get home and you realize that your order is wrong. You're angry. The only thing worse than that is when your order's not there. And it makes us angry because they're so stupid. And how hard is it? And all you who have ever worked in the food industry, you're like, you have no idea. It used to be the little things. And, and now, I want you to know, the whole drive through thing, it doesn't happen to me when Zoe's with me because she's a bag checker. She's like, no, 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 don't leave, don't drive, stay right here. And she checks the bag, and I'm like looking in the mirror and getting stressed out because the people are behind me. And I'm like, they just saw me get handed this bag, and they know I should be leaving now, and they're probably impatient like me. And I get this whole internal conversation until she gives me the, okay, it's all good. Um, you know, or no, 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 we're missing something, you know, and then I have to be a Karen and like knock on the window and be like, hey, uh, you know, uh. <laughs> how about being offended in a movie theater? Anybody still go to the movies? Like I kind of rate my movie theater offenses and levels. Level one is when someone talks at the movie or to the movie, like to the characters, Um, level two is, um, when they talk to the person next to them in the movie theater. Um, level three is when they receive a phone call in the movie theater and they haven't silenced their phones and they put it up there on the screen for everyone to know and they answer it and talk on the phone. That's level three. Level four, and this is right up there with the unforgivable sin, is when they actually dial out and talk to someone on the phone from the movie theater. And they will answer to God in heaven for that, um, I, I believe. But those were like normal offenses, right? You're just kind of mad in the moment and it sort of wears off. And, and, and yet today, um, the offenses are different and it's really escalated. Because almost every day, someone informs me about the new thing that I'm supposed to be offended by. And you guys know what I'm talking about because it always starts out like this. Did you hear? And you're like, hear what? And they're like, obviously you didn't hear. You know, and then they proceed to tell you about the thing that you and I are supposed to be offended by. And I don't know about you, but I just don't have the emotional bandwidth to care about every new offensive topic. I just can't do it. And, and neither do you. And so that's why we pick and choose our favorite ones or the ones that are really important to us. 
And these are the ones that we think everyone's supposed to be upset about. These are the ones that we think everyone is supposed to be working together to fix. These are the ones that we believe it's our Christian duty to be offended by. And those are the ones we pick. And it's always a very single issue amongst hundreds or maybe even thousands of other issues. But you get angry about your offenses. You get angry about the things you care about. And if you're not careful, and many of us do this, we take it to the next level. You know what that is? It's when you get angry at other people because they're not angry enough about the thing that you're angry about. That's like some inception level, you know, that's like a little too deep. We actually get mad at other people for not caring about the thing that we care about. Some of y'all are giggling looking at the person next to you right now. Is that too real? Because I feel like anger's kind of evolving. And I don't know if you are like this, but I find myself being more easily agitated. I find myself being more easily angered. And at the end of the day, I don't think that's pleasing to God. And it's hard to admit, and this may not be true for everyone, but I do think there's people who like being angry. And y'all know who I'm talking about. They always got the resting blessed face. They're always the one coming up to you going, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you see on Fox News last night? Did you see on CNN? Did you see what I posted? on? Go look at what I posted on Facebook, you know, and you're like, oh, yeah, another one of these guys. Um, (laughs) And I like to call it recreational outrage. Like it's just some people's favorite pastime. And I wouldn't say that they like what angers them but they enjoy forming strong opinions and they enjoy the camaraderie and the community of their like-minded tribe. I mean, people. Um, And, you know, these people, like, they've got 203 friends on Facebook and they're all ticked about the same thing and they all post the same things and they all care about the same things and they all like and comment on the same things because you've blocked everyone who doesn't agree with you already. You've blocked everyone who's a Democrat or Republican or against this or for that. You already blocked them because you don't want to see that. You just want to live in in an echo chamber and see and hear the things that you agree with. And then, you know, you have all your friends on there and and they're posting on your things going, right's right and wrong's wrong and, and preaching brother and, and amen, you know, and, and then they're sharing it and then it just goes on and on and on. And those of you who haven't blocked everyone and you like the negative comments, you're what they call a troll. <laughs> and you need to be reminded that the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> and when we're angry If we're honest, sometimes it's kind of fun because we feel morally superior to the opposing arguments and stances because we're right and everyone else is wrong. I heard a story one time about a husband and wife and, um, you know, they always kind of have the same routine every morning. They'd wake up, drink their coffee, eat breakfast. He would drive to work and she would watch the news. And so they had went through this whole routine. He had left the house. She was watching the news and she saw on the news that there was a crazy person driving the wrong way on the road, just bob and weave and going the wrong way. And she's like, oh my gosh, this is the road my husband takes every morning on his way to work. And so she picked up her phone and called him and she goes, honey, you got to know there's a maniac driving the wrong way, endangering everyone on the road you take to work. He said, honey, I hate to break it to you. They're all driving the wrong way. (laughs) We think that we're right and everyone else is wrong. You know why? Because they're evil or because they're an idiot or they're an evil idiot. And that's the worst, right? And we're easily angered. And again, I don't think that that's pleasing to God. And so I want to pose this question to you. How effective is your anger? Where's it getting you? Like, how's it going? Is it making you more like Jesus? Is it pointing others to intimacy and life and freedom and joy that's found in Christ? 
How effective is your anger? Is it making you more loving? Is it drawing other people into a more joyful life? How's your blood pressure, right? How's it working out? And I'll give you a little spoiler alert. The answer is no, it's not working out. It's not effective. And that's according to scripture because we just read James chapter one, verse 19. But if we continue on and we add verse 20 to it, it reads like this, beginning in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It's not going to work. It's not ever going to be effective. Your human anger, for, for whatever reason, your anger at the small offense or your anger at the major betrayal, your anger at the opposing political view, your anger at the guy who gave you the middle finger in the parking lot, whatever it is, your human anger, my human anger, does not produce the righteousness of God, period. And that's God's word. It's not my opinion, it's his word. And, and if you're like me, you might want to push back and say, but, but Pastor Cody, you don't understand. My anger is the righteous kind. I've got the good anger. I've got the anger that we're allowed to have. I've got righteous anger because I'm mad about sin. And you might be. There probably is such a thing as righteous hatred towards something that breaks God's heart. But I don't know if you've ever noticed this about righteous anger, but when we're angry about sin, we're always angry about someone else's sin. We're very rarely outraged and, and just angry and upset and triggered at our own sin and our own offenses. It's always about someone else's sin. And so my question is simple. Is it really righteous anger or is it self-righteous anger? Because we are holier than thou. I believe in many ways it's the self-righteous kind. Because as a Christian, it's really easy to point out the sins we don't commit and then get really quiet about the ones we struggle with. It's really easy to criticize their foul language and then ignore our spiritual pride or our greed. It's easy to judge their sexual sin and overlook our gluttony. But the Bible says that, what? It's no greater sin. And have I offended you yet, by the way? Because I'm coming for everybody. That's my goal. Um, I'm coming for you. <laughs> But we tend to think that our anger is justified. Why? Because it's our anger and we're right and they're wrong. And so our anger is right. But the question is, how effective is your anger? How effective is it? What is it getting you? Is it drawing people to the grace and the goodness and the love of Jesus through your anger? Is your anger bringing you more joy? Is it enhancing your quality of life? Is it blessing and enhancing your marriage? Is it... Uh, giving your children a life that they want to emulate, one that's blessing others or always criticizing others. Because as followers of Jesus, we ultimately have to make a decision. We have to make a decision. And the decision is this. We need to decide when we get angry, do we want to make a point or do we want to make a difference? Because they're very, very different. When we get angry, are we concerned about making a point and being right, or are we concerned about making a difference and being reconciled? Because they're very, very different. Because too many people today, they simply want to make a point. They want to post it and then forget about it and watch the likes and shares and comments roll in. They want to make a point. We call those keyboard warriors, right? Right? And they're typed up with Cheeto fingers in mom's basement. No, I'm just kidding. Um, if we want to make a difference, and I believe we're called to make a difference, I would submit to you we need a different attitude 
and a different philosophy with dealing with the wrongs of this world. We're all aware of the wrongs. We're all aware of the offenses. So the question is simple. Are we going to make a difference or make a point? And if we're going to make a difference, we have to have a different attitude and a different philosophy. And rather than letting our flesh and our feelings and our emotion direct our action, we need to let the Spirit of God direct our action. So we're not just making a point, but we're making a difference. We're not just trying to win an argument, but we're trying to win people to the grace and the goodness of Jesus. And that is very different. If we're concerned about winning arguments, we're just going to make enemies. If we're concerned about winning people to Jesus, then we're going to make converts. And we're going to make heaven bigger and hell smaller. And those are very, very different. And so in the Bible, there's this really smart guy. Um, He was an expert in the law. And so he asked Jesus a question. And this is one of the three that Jesus actually answers directly. So this is rare. We're in like rare air right here where this expert of the law, he comes to Jesus. He asks a good question. Jesus must have thought it was a good question because he actually answered it directly and not in like parables and riddles. And like, well, it's kind of like this, you know, and, you know, y'all aren't smart enough to understand. So let me dumb it down where it's available to everyone on all levels, you know, Um, He answers it directly. And the guy basically asks him, he goes, Jesus, what's the most important thing? We got all these laws, all these rules, all these scriptures. What's the most important? What do I need to be the most concerned about? What is the one that's most important that I get right? And Jesus answers it directly. He says to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. He says, this is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. You want to know what's important? To love God with everything in you. To let every fiber of your being uh, worship him, love him, glorify him in all that you do. And do you know how you do this? One of the ways that you do this, and I believe it may be the greatest way that we do it, is by loving his people, loving his children, even the ones who don't look like you, don't think like you, don't vote like you, don't come from the same background you do, don't come from the same denomination, the same religion, don't, don't have the same sexual preference as you, to love them. to show them grace, to have empathy, to have compassion, to show them his goodness and his love. And you know what I realized? You don't have to be angry to do that. In fact, I would say being angry hinders you from doing that. And so I have to ask myself, can I be angry and show consistent love and grace to other people? And for me, I think the answer is no. Because when you think about it, Jesus never, ever told us you have to be right. He said you have to be loving. Do you want to make a point or do you want to make a difference? Because hearts are rarely ever changed by anger, accusations, and judgment. But hearts are changed by empathy, compassion, discussion, and love. So we want to be people who lead with love and not with anger because anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, don't get me wrong. I've got, I've got really strong opinions and I'd love to share them with you sometime. I've got opinions about everything under the sun and I believe in my heart and soul that they're all right. Like, you know, and, and whatever's not right, we'll, we'll settle it. You know, me and God will figure it out, you know, like in eternity. But for right now, I'm convinced that all my opinions are right until I change one of them, you know, and then, and then it's right, you know, from there on. But as much as I have these opinions, I can't let my opinions overrule my calling to share the love of Jesus. I can't get sidetracked by little things that are not nearly as important as the gospel of Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So I can either try to win an argument or I can try to win people to Jesus. I can try to make a point, or I can try to make a difference. It's up to us. But one of them is going to produce the righteousness of God, and one of them is not. So how do we learn to let go of that anger that we're carrying around? Because most of us, we have like baseline anger, right? 
Like it's probably slowly risen over time and you don't realize it, but your baseline is just like, you're always kind of angry. Like anybody clench their teeth, clench their fists, you know, like in your neck when you get done, like at the end of the day, you're like, oh gosh, my neck. It's because you're like, like this all the time. Because you're mad, because you're angry, because you're right and so many people are wrong. How do we let go of that anger? I want to give you two thoughts that I think are incredibly helpful and then an assignment. So the first thing that I want to encourage you to do, and this is, this is revolutionary stuff right here, so y'all should write this down, post it, something. Get a tattoo of it maybe. Lower your expectations of other people. Lower your expectations of other people. Just lower what you expect from other people around you. <laughs> because what will happen a lot of times, someone's going to lie to you. They're going to let you down. They're going to betray you. They're not going to show up for your thing, even though you showed up for their thing. They're not going to say thank you for the thing you did. They're not going to call you back. They're not going to appreciate you. They're not going to treat you the way that you're treating them. It's going to happen. They're not going to be there for you. They're going to forget your birthday. They're not going to be there for your shower, even though you were there for their shower. And you got a really good gift for them, and they didn't get you anything. And you gave them a thank you card, and they didn't give you a thank you card. You're going to be disappointed. And to that, all I have to say is, what do you expect? Have you never let someone down? They're people. This might not make sense to you, but it made sense to me. People are going to people. It's just going to happen. People are going to do what people do. They're going to let you down. So lower your expectations. If you start always elevating your expectations and thinking that everyone's going to love you, you're always going to be hurt. And the reason is you're raising people to the level of Jesus. And only he can rise to that level. And just as a little caveat, I'll say this and leave it there for you and then move on. I see this happen where we raise the level to Jesus and expect other people to fill it. I see this in relationships all the time. Dating relationships, marriage relationships. There is a void in your life that only Jesus can fill. And you put the unrealistic expectations on the other person to be your Messiah Savior and they can't do it and it's unfair to them and it's going to leave you disappointed. And I'm just going to leave that there. If you want to know what you can expect from people, the Bible tells us, if you ever think that we're living in end times, Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Amen, somebody. Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So are you surprised when they don't call you back? These are the reasonable expectations. Sinful people do sinful things. And if you're not Jesus, you're not perfect, and people will let you down. And church, I hate to tell you this, but I'm going to let you down. I'm going to let you down. I'm not pointing to me. I'm trying to do my very best to point to Jesus. But I can promise you, maybe eventually, if you follow me around, you listen to everything I say, I'm going to do something or say something that's going to let you down because I'm not perfect. And I want you to promise me something. Promise me that when that happens, you won't say God's not real. Promise me you won't say the church betrayed me because the church didn't betray you and God is still real. What happened is a sinful person wasn't perfect, just like you're not perfect. So I want you to promise me that. Lower your expectations of people. Lower your expectation of me. When you think about Jesus, 
He was never shocked by people's self-centeredness. He was never shocked by their ability to sin. He was never like, I can't believe that they're, they're being sinful. And, and we, we see this when Jesus walks up on the woman at the well. All right, he comes up on the woman at the well. And um, she's been married five different times, which is kind of a lot, even for today. <laughs> um, you would think after going through Dave Glass divorce care, you know, we'd figure some things out, but they, she hasn't. She's been married five different times. And Jesus, in his uh, omniscience, knows that the man she's with is not the man that she's married to. So you know what's happening? She's shacking up and doing the deed. And she's not supposed to. And Jesus knows this. Making sure y'all were awake. <laughs> what did Jesus do? He said, you know what? I got to get away from you. <laughs> you, got, you got sin issues. You, you got issues you need to work out. You need to go see somebody, get some medication, something but I don't need to be around this. No, 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 Jesus didn't do that. Did Jesus go, oh man, this is rich. I cannot wait to tell Peter, James, and John about this. And it's not gossip because we're going to pray about it after we get done talking about them. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He's like, we're going to pray for you because you're looking for love in all the wrong places. I mean, all of them. You've explored all the other places. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't judge. He wasn't shocked. What he did was he offered her living water. He offered her the one thing that was going to satisfy her, the one thing that was going to fill the void in her life that she was trying to fill with multiple partners. It helped meet the need that she was looking for. He wasn't shocked by her scandalous behavior. Instead, he offered her something greater. And that's what I mean when I say, do we want to win an argument? Do we want to make a point or do we want to make a difference and win people to Jesus? Because that's the example that he gives us. Lower your expectations. <laughs> We're all sinners. We all mess up. People are going to let you down. People are going to people. Okay, I, don't, I want to put that on a t-shirt and I want to explain it to everyone who asks me what it means because it, it means something to me and, and I like it. I think it's clever. Um, <laughs> Daniel just raised his hand. He's like, I'll have you a shirt by Monday. People are going to people. That's going to go like under our Liberty Hill logo. Liberty Hill Church, people are going to, anyways. You know, I've had people ask me before, like, how do you deal with, you know, the criticism of being a pastor over the years? And honestly, I've just, I kind of know that that's what people are going to do. I don't really expect anything different at this point. Um, I guess you could say I've lowered my expectations. The second thing that I want to encourage you to do. So the first thing is to lower your expectations. The second thing <laughs> that I want to encourage you to do this morning is raise your gratitude for God's grace. Lower your expectations of other people and raise your gratitude for God's grace. I would love to see a show of hands of everyone in here who has never, ever, 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 never sinned. Only Elle should be raising her hand because she's still perfect right now. <laughs> never sinned. Okay. You never lied. You never cheated. You never looked lustfully. You never envied. You never gossiped on a friend. You never farted in an elevator. <laughs> and that's sinful if you've ever been in an elevator. Some of y'all got claustrophobia issues. You're stairs people. It's, you know. If you've ever been in one or a compact car, maybe, you're like, that's up there with the talking in the movie theater. <laughs> Let's reel it back in, people. Romans 3.23. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who's all? All. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So how is it that we're made right with God? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 says this. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, but it is the gift of God. It's not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his worksmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We've been saved by grace, through faith, not according to our works, not according to the things we got right along the way. Because if that was the case, we would have something to brag about. But the only thing that we have to brag about is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In other words, it's not because you were good. It's not because you're holy. It's not because you had it all together. It's not because you did everything right in church and never did anything wrong. It's not because of you or me at all. It's because of this free gift in Jesus Christ, not by works. You can't earn it. You can't achieve it. All you can do is receive it by grace through faith. It's a free gift of Jesus. It's by the grace of God. It's by the goodness of God. It's by the mercy of God. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, because of his perfection and his righteousness. And when you put these things together, you'll find that it changes you. It changes you when you lower your expectations of other people, and it changes you when you realize how grateful you are and how dead you and I were to our sin if it wasn't for Jesus. When you're more grateful for his grace than you've ever been before. It's not our goodness. It's not our works. It's all his grace. You might be listening to me saying, but they lied to me. I've lied. But they stole from me. I've stole too. But you don't get it. They're so arrogant. I'm arrogant. I'm going to quit listing all my sins before you leave the church. But you know what I'm talking about, right? I need the grace of God, just like you need the grace of God. Carly, I want you to give me my prop. It makes me feel comfortable to have my stone. Now, some of y'all have been stoned before, but not like this. I'm gonna let that one hang there for a minute. Some of y'all have been stoned before, but not like this. But it makes me comfortable to have my stone. And listen, church, I don't want to minimize whatever hurt or or trauma that you might be enduring right now. Because I know we're talking about trivial things. I know we're talking about vaccines and and masks and, 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 you know, these trivial things that we get all worked up about. But I know that there's some people in here that you're facing some real deep, significant pain, that people have done things to you that are unspeakable. Maybe someone has done something to your child. Maybe someone that you trusted, someone you lived with and loved, a spouse was was living a, a double life. I don't know what kind of horrible betrayal you may be facing right now. What, kind, what, what type of level of offense? But I know that whenever we're hurt and whenever we're angry, we tend to get this thought of I'm right and they're wrong. I'm right and they're wrong. And it makes us comfortable to carry this stone around because I'm right and they're wrong. I might be hurt, I might be bruised, I might be broken, but this makes me feel good because I'm right and they're wrong. I'm right and they're wrong and I'm, I'm, I'm justified in my anger. I have the right to hold this stone. If you're not careful, your anger will make you feel justified in your right to be walking around holding the stone. And the only thing about carrying your stone is it's, it's pretty heavy. And over time, it's going to weigh you down. And you don't realize it, but it, it, it takes a lot of It takes a lot of energy to to grip this and to hold on to it. So it makes you tense. It weighs you down and it makes you tense. (laughs) I'm not going to throw it. (laughs) But I'm going to hold on to it in case I need to throw it. Not actually going to stone anyone else for what they did to me. But I've got it just in case, just in case you hurt my kid, in case y'all go breathe on her. I got, 
I got this right here. And the thing about carrying that stone around is people might not see it, but they can sense that you are locked and loaded. They can sense that you're, that you're guarded. They can sense that you're on edge. And what will happen is they'll begin to avoid you. Not because of what that other person did to you, but because you're carrying the stone around. You're carrying the offense around. You haven't lowered your expectations of other people. You haven't elevated your gratitude for God's grace and goodness. And so you're carrying your stone around. And it's human nature, isn't it? It's human nature. When I'm right and you're wrong and I'm justified, so I get to carry my stone around. But the thing is, we're not called to live in the natural. We're called to live in the supernatural. And then before long, what happens is you get used to holding it and you forget that you've been holding this stone. And whereas you might have only been carrying it before for the really big thing that someone did to you, now you're carrying it around for all the little things. You voted for who? You think, what about masks and vaccines? Let's see you take my gun. We feel, we feel justified and we carry it around and we're, we're always on edge. And I get to hold my stone because I'm right and you're wrong. And my anger gives me the right to hold my stone. And in John chapter 8, there was a woman caught in a sinful act. She and another guy were caught in the act of adultery. And in the Old Testament, it was punishable by death. And so there's an angry group of men who gathered around holding their stones. And here's the question that never gets asked. Where were they at that they caught someone in the act of adultery? It's worth thinking about. But nonetheless, they gather her and they bring her to Jesus. And they're saying she deserves death because she sinned. And you know what? In a sense, they were right according to the law. And so they're saying, let's stone her for her sin. And Jesus, he wasn't shocked. He wasn't angry. He wasn't offended. But instead it says he knelt down and he started scribbling something in the sand. We don't know exactly what he wrote in the sand, but tradition would tell us that he began writing the sins of the people there that were wanting to stone her, starting from the oldest to the youngest. And it says that they began to leave one by one from the oldest to the youngest. They began to walk away. And then Jesus looks at her and he asks her, he says, where are your accusers? She says, I have none. One day you and I are going to stand in heaven. And the only defense we're going to be able to give for our life and why we should go into heaven is going to be Jesus Christ. And we're going to look around and we're not going to see the accuser. We're going to see Jesus. That's what's been done for you and I. And on earth, Jesus asked her, he says, where are your accusers? She says, I have none. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus is basically asking the people around, okay, you're angry? You're justified? You've got merit? You know for a fact that she did this? that they did this to you and it's wrong? You want to do something about it? You want to right the wrongs? Okay. Whichever one of you hasn't sinned, you're the, you can be the first one to throw a stone at her and I won't say or do anything. I imagine he looks at him and like, that's what I thought. So the question is, if we're going to be followers of Christ, and we're not gonna throw it, why are we carrying it around? Why are we carrying around our offense? Why are we carrying around our anger? Why are we carrying something that weighs us down, that takes away our energy, that makes us tense, that makes people avoid us? We are not God's enforcers. We are his followers. There are so many injustices in this world and they break the heart of God. What happened to you breaks the heart of God. And it's easy for us to want to be righteously angry. 
But I would submit to you that really angry people have a hard time making a difference. If we deal with enough anger, at some point, Jesus may say this to you. Lower your expectations of other people and raise your gratitude for his grace. And because of the goodness of God and what you've been forgiven for, it's time to drop your stone. And this morning, that's what I'm here to tell you guys. You don't need to carry it around. You're not going to throw it. Carrying it around is not doing anything for you. And it's time to drop your stone. I woke y'all up. And what I want you to know is you're not freeing the offender, you're freeing yourself. Bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, it's like swallowing poison and waiting on the other person to die. You're freeing yourself to love and to be loved. You're freeing yourself to make a difference. Church, would you stand to your feet with me this morning? Because Jesus didn't just call us to be right, but he called us to be loving. And our goal, I'll tell you my goal, is not to make a point, but to make a difference. My goal is not to convert you to my view on some peripheral issue. My goal is to help you see the love of the one who changed my life and his name is Jesus. That's my highest goal and my highest calling. And because human anger, my human anger, and your human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires. I'm calling on all of us, myself included, to rise above it, to lead with love, to make a difference in this world and point this world to Jesus, to lead with love. And this morning, I start with myself before you. I bear it all before you. I, my prayer to God is, God, help me to not be so easily angered, so easily agitated, so easily offended. God, help me not to be carrying my stone around all the time. It doesn't do anything for me, but it takes everything from me. God, help me to lower my expectations of other people and raise my gratitude for your goodness and what you did for me. I start with myself. So this morning, if you're here and you would say, you know what, pastor, that's me too. I don't want to be wrongly and easily offended. I don't want to just make a point, but I want God to use me to make a difference. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand with me? If that's you, you're saying, you know what? I don't want to be so easily offended. I don't want to be so easily angered. I don't want to make a point. I want to make a difference. I want to lower my expectations of other people. And I want to raise my gratitude for what God's done for me. Praise God. Praise God. In these next few moments that we have together, we're going to worship and we're going to praise and we're going to sing because God is worthy and deserving of all we have to give. But also we're going to have a special time here in this altar where you can come and you can pray. You can ask for God's help. And my hope is that like me, many of you will come to this altar and you'll drop that stone and you'll leave it there and you'll walk out feeling lighter and better. You'll walk out with the ability to love and to be loved. So there's going to be altar workers who come forward, and if you raised your hand this morning, I encourage you to come to this altar and meet with the Lord today. Hey, I'm Cody Kelly. I'm the lead pastor here at Liberty Hill Church. I just wanted to take a moment and personally thank you for taking time out of your day to join in with us and be a part of this service. We would love to connect with you moving forward. If you would, go ahead and hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell so we can be connected from here on. And if you have a praise report, a prayer request, or if you've made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, we would seriously love to hear about it. And you can connect with us and let us know about how God is working in your life through this ministry by texting the word pray to the number on the screen. If you'd like to partner with us, you can also give to this ministry financially by visiting our website, libertyhillchurch.org and selecting give. Until next time, we can't wait to see you again.